Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Half and Half this morning. Glad to have you with us today. Um, Scott put a little quiz in the chat about the shoulder girdle, and I'm not sure anybody answered it. Maybe everybody was having grade school anxiety about test taking, or maybe, um, yeah, maybe you just thought, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it's interesting because Scott and I had a little uh, back and forth about the answer to it um, because it, the shoulder girdle, if we want to get super technical about the title, um, evidently is presented in slightly different ways. He had a different theory about what all encompass the shoulder girdle than I did. Um, but I like um, his and it's more intuitive to me to use that. So I'm just going to go with that one. Um, so you have these bones in your shoulder. Um, and the shoulder girdle, right, is kind of the, kind of how you like could take the whole arm, um, like construct and place it on your rib cage, right? It's the bones that sit on your rib cage that are the attachment, um, attachment to your shoulder. Um, and so it would be your clavicle bones, your collar bones, and then your scapula bones, which are your shoulder blade bones, and they attach to your sternum. So that was my sort of what I have read in literature about how the shoulder girdle is defined is those bones, the sternum, the clavicle, and the um, scapula, right? And so they just kind of plop right on the rib cage and then your arm bones, your humerus bones uh, slot in to the joint um, in the scapula. Now, Scott was including in the shoulder girdle those arm bones or that shoulder joint place too, which makes sense, right? Because when you think of your shoulder, you actually have your clavicle and your scapula and your humerus all together, right? So that makes sense. So we're going to take all those joints. We're going to go through all of them and it's kind of a lot. So you have the, the place that your clavicle, your collarbone attaches to your sternum, your breastbone. So there's two joints right there. And then you have a joint right on top of the shoulder, which is where your collarbone attaches to your scapula, right? Which is kind of a, sometimes a surprise, I think, right? That, you're, that your back body is connected to your front body by the clavicle, right? But that scapula, it has a little bone that reaches up and over the shoulder. And then the collarbone goes right in and uh, meets it. And that's called the acromio. Uh, clavicular joint. Sometimes people call it the AC joint, which seems a little easier, but it's where your collarbone and your scapula come together. So you have two of those joints, one on either side there. Then you've got the shoulder joint that I was talking about earlier. And the arm connects into your scapula. The joint for the shoulder joint is between the scapula, shoulder blade, and humerus arm bone, right? So those two go together. So it's kind of like a little um, chain, right? Like they're not all really together. It's like sternum to clavicle, clavicle to scapula, scapula to arm, right? All that kind of moves together. So I've got those two joints. So I'm at one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's this joint that sometimes people call a fake joint. Um, and I might even not have the actual term right. I think it's thoracoscapular joint or scapulothoracic that might be a scapulothoracic joint. Um, but it's where your shoulder blade and your rib cage come together. And the reason sometimes people call it a fake joint is there's not a bony attachment between your scapula and your rib cage. There's just tissue. There's fascia, there's muscle, there's, there's a way that your shoulder blade glides on your rib cage and has relationship with your rib cage and has like uh, defined movements. You know, um, there are there are, there's a glossary for the for the actions of the scapula and how it moves and articulates with the rib cage, but it's not like a bone to bone joint like all the other ones, right? They all had two bones that connected to. So um, yeah, so I think we counted all those, and then Scott said, "Oh, there's one more," and I, now I can't remember what it is. I think it's rib cage to collarbone. Sometimes people call that a joint, um, but I think I think. Um, that got us to six, right? Or three, depending on how you count it. If you count both right and left, you're at six. 
um, I think, or did that get us to, I can't remember. I may not be counting right. One, two, three, four, five, six. It got us to eight, seven, eight, if we counted that, or four, if you're not counting right and left. So it's a lot of joints um, that you're looking at. And then maybe if you added these clavicle ones in, right, you could say five um, or 10. Um, so there's a lot that can go on in the shoulder. And so, so if we compare that to the hip joint, which often the shoulder and the hip are compared to each other, right? Because the start of my leg is my hip joint. The start of my arm is my shoulder. The hip joint's basically just the hip joint, right? It's your pelvis and then it's your thigh bone and it's a ball and socket joint there. It's pretty sturdy, pretty uh, uh, held together well. It doesn't dislocate very easily. Um, a lot of ligaments around it, kind of deep socket in there. Um, so there's your hip joint, but then your shoulder joint, it's like, this little zigzaggy thing, your shoulder girdle, there's all this stuff that can happen there, all these potential movements that we can look at in the shoulder girdle. And that makes sense because we need our arms to be very mobile and movable because we need to be able to reach out and grab things and relate to the world and understand the world and open doorknobs and turn doorknobs and eat food and all these things we do with them. Um, with our hands. And so we like that mobility in the shoulder, but it's not quite so stable, right? Because there's so many like little things that happen when I move my arm in all those different joints. So you always get a little bit of a trade-off in those things. So it's good to work on stability um, and strength in the shoulder because the joint itself is a little less stable. But also, like, it's good to work on mobility, right? Because a lot of us feel tight in our shoulders. And those two things can go together. If I'm not really strong in my stability muscles, if I don't have those deep muscles working in a really coordinated and healthy way, then the big surface muscles um, all come on and they just kind of go... <laughs> And everything gets stuck in my shoulder. My shoulder just doesn't move very well because it's not stable. And so I have every muscle that's supposed to make all these articulate movements. It's like every muscle comes on and just goes and locks down. So a tight shoulder is not necessarily a strong shoulder, right? It's not a very like foundationally uh, mature shoulder. Right, when it's tight like that. So we're always looking at both within that. Like, how do I create more mobility in my shoulder and deep strength in my shoulder, which creates more mobility, which allows me to access more deep strength, right? And then once I have that deep strength, well, then the surface muscles are good. Let's add to it with like big pec muscles or trapezius muscles or, um, you know, any of those, any of those muscles in the shoulder um, around the lats latissimus dorsi and all that um so yeah so i could i could talk about that a while and we could spend like a year talking about the shoulder girdle and all the way that it moves um but let's start with that um and let's start with just maybe feeling the three um three of the shoulder movements i think that we talked about so um there's the arm movement right? The humerus to the scapula. That's called the shoulder joint, technically, but it's basically the movement of your arm. There's the scapula movement. The scapula has that feeling of kind of like up and down and forward and back, right? That kind of movement, all those movements around. And then similar to that, there's the collarbone movement, right? Like there's how does the clavicle go up and down? And so that's happening, that place that the clavicle attaches to the sternum is moving a little bit. And then the AC joint is moving a little bit. So as my scapula goes up, my collarbone goes up. As my scapula goes down, my collarbone goes down. So it seems simple, right? You're just shrugging your shoulder. You've done that before a lot, probably. But then what happens if you think about, okay, the this part of the collarbone goes down and this outer part of the collarbone goes up as my scapula goes up and then scapula and side part of the clavicle goes down. I have a little seesaw in the clavicle up and down. With the scapula there. Do the same thing with the other arm. Just kind of move the shoulder arm around, shoulder joint around. Feel what that's like. 
and then maybe a finger on each side of the clavicle and feel the shoulder blade moving up and down collarbone kind of seesaws down and then flat and then thinking a little more specifically about the scapula right back and forth up and down maybe like it circles around a little bit And then of course, generally these movements all go together, right? So if I were to start circling my arm up, the higher it goes, the more my scapula and collarbone comes up. <clears throat> As my arm goes behind me, I feel my scapula kind of pull in towards my spine. It's this lovely like coordinated thing. So just taking a circle around, collarbone seesaw, scapula up and back, and then do it in reverse arm reaches back, scapula comes in, AC joint up, seesaw collarbone. And feeling that. And then same thing on the other side, feeling elbow starts to reach up, arm starts to reach up, collarbone seesaw movement, scapula coming up, Scapula pulling a little back and coming back down as the arm goes back and trying to feel the sequencing. They move together, but they also sequence, right? Arm, collarbone, scapula, arm, scapula behind you, everything back down. Take it in reverse, reaching the elbow back. Feel how the blade comes in a little bit towards your spine. It goes up. You get that collarbone, seesaw, arm comes forward. Everything drops down together. And then resting all that. Okay. And then just kind of, you know, it always sort of makes me want to move my head and neck around a little after I do that. And then just kind of the sense of like, okay, there's some weight now, right? The collarbone just rests on the rib cage, scapula <clears throat> resting, arms resting, armpits relaxed. You have a towel or a strap, grab it. And let's use that coming up to standing. So when we do this strap work, which maybe we haven't done in here in a little while, but when we do the strap work, we often do these little pulls out, right? I have you go pull and release, pull and release. And then I've also talked about before, not grabbing in your forearm or not gripping too much in your hand and your wrist. That one's a little tricky. But the point of that is to send the work somewhere else. And where we really want to send the work I talk about the triceps a lot, and that's partly because triceps are kind of easier to feel than some of the other muscles I want to get to. So it's nice to just have a way in and feel those triceps. But really what I want, what I'm trying to get to kind of my end game, is the rotator cuff muscles. And the rotator cuff muscles are harder to feel. They have to be a little more imagined, especially in the beginning. Um, but even if you just do it for you know, eight or 10, sometimes you start to feel them by the ninth or 10th one. So even if you can just wait that long. Um, but the rotator cuff muscles are muscles that go from the scapula to the humerus. And they're very, very deep. And they're really good for stabilizing your shoulder. And when they don't work well, a lot of times what we get is all that like tight pectoralis major and pec minor probably too. Those muscles on the front just get really tight. They pull our shoulders forward. Um, and, and it's not very stabilizing for the shoulder. So the rotator cuff is really good to create foundation and stability. So um, when you are doing a little pull out, you want to think of muscles on the shoulder blade, on the scapula, that connect to the upper part back of the arm bone. So sometimes my shorthand is to say upper back of the shoulder. Work in the upper back of the shoulder, right? So elbows are wide. Hands are easy, forearms are easy. You do a little pull out 
and just take your attention to those places I was just talking about. They may or may not work, but that's where your attention is. And then let it go. And then do a little pull out. This is also why I have you bend the elbows and take them wide. It's usually helpful in getting into those muscles a little more. Release it. And I'm not pulling as hard as I can. If I pull as hard as I can, I'm going to go forearm and grip. Muscles are going to come on a lot. I'm probably going to end up in my chest a little more. So I have to pull at about 70%. I have to think about that much. Maybe even 50%. Until I get a sense of those muscles. And once they're working a little more, then I might pull a little more to make those muscles work more. Probably still never going to go to like 100% pull. And a couple more. And then pull out and hold it. Okay, now, if you have a feeling in those muscles, great. Keep that feeling. If you're visualizing that space, great, keep visualizing that space. We're going to keep a little tug on the uh, towel and start to come up. Can you feel those muscles still supporting you as you come up? And then lower down. And then if we went back to the joint conversation, you are just moving the shoulder joint. You're not moving the scapula. You're not moving the collarbones, just arm bone moves. And if you notice, I don't go very high. I don't even quite get to shoulder height because I'm, that's all I can do without moving the scapula and the collarbone. That's about all any of us can do, really. <laughs> like you, you might be able to go higher, but chances are you've moved the rest of the shoulder girdle if you've gone higher or you stopped working those rotator cuff muscles so not super high now next time you're up there keep it there and we're going to do the pulls here same focus pulling out and release elbows are slightly bent and lifted out wide upper back of the shoulder Triceps, easy hands, loose grip, release. 50 to 70% pull, release, and pull, and release. And one more time, pull, and hold it. Okay, now we get to move all the joints. So arm, collarbone, scapula, Everything floats up. Now let it all come down. Arm, collarbone, scapula. Back where you started. Reaching up. Feel the collarbone seesaw. The scapula rise up a little bit. Pretty good amount, actually. And then everything comes down. Your collarbone seesaw levels out. Arms come down. So I'm letting my arm kind of pull my collarbones up off my ribcage. I don't want to lift my ribcage with it, right? Then I haven't moved at those joints. I have to leave my ribcage where it is. And then I know I've moved at the, all those joints, those three to five to ten joints, <laughs> however you want to count them. <laughs> And one more. And all the way down. Mm -hmm. So, especially at that last one, I started feeling my deltoid muscle a little bit more too, which is a pretty good muscle to strengthen um, for stabilizing the shoulder as well and getting more articulate movement in the shoulder. So the deltoid is kind of that little cap 
right on the shoulder, that muscle that kind of caps the shoulder there. So as well as my rotator cuff muscles, especially to go overhead, I started feeling that deltoid muscle more too. Um, so maybe you felt some of that. So let's take the towel behind you. And then same, uh, same idea. And this one I think is a really good way to get into, um, into the rotator cuff, upper back of the shoulder muscles between the scapula and the arm, right? So I'm going to get the deltoid I just talked about. I'm going to end up with the backside of that working, my tricep working, and then hopefully starting to feel some of that muscle around the scapula, that deep upper back of the shoulder. So pull, but not too hard. Don't grip your wrist. Soften your elbow. Don't point your elbows back. That one's hard. Point them out. And instead of the elbows pulling back, you're going to think of the armpit pulling back. It's a bit counterintuitive. And then from there, as I go back again, I'm going to keep my shoulder girdle still. I'm going to move my arm. So I'm not going to move my shoulder blades. I'm not going to move my collarbones. I'm going to just let my arm float back. So I really feel the shoulder joint and I'll just emphasize that it's not wrong to move your shoulder blades or your collarbones. It's not what we're doing right now. And it won't get into your rotator cuff muscles. If you pull your blades together, you will not really get into your rotator cuff. You'll get into other muscles. So let's try to get into that rotator cuff by leaving the scapula in place. Little bit of pull, armpit reaches back, elbows stay wide. One more. And then rest. Okay, so we kind of worked all around the shoulder, which is great. Um, give us a little more sense of that. Let's get to the mat. So however you want to work your way down, you can find your way down. So then we're going to see what it's like to put weight on, uh, on the hands and use some of this work around the shoulder to help create stability in my shoulder. So, you know, when you put weight on your hands, most of us have difficulty. We start feeling it in our wrists, right? That's very common. And so... Uh, strengthening the shoulder girdle and working that well can help not put too much pressure on your wrist. But sometimes when you get on your hands, the first thing that happens is your spine sags. And as your spine sags, your shoulder blades come together and your elbows lock and your weight goes on your wrist and all this stuff. So if we think about that shoulder girdle, just like we did with the towel, we went up to that place where it was really steady and in place and the elbows are wide. You had a little bit of pull. Can you use that feeling? And that's how you support the weight on your hands is with wide elbow, upper back of the shoulder, collarbones and shoulder blades, pretty, pretty much neutral. Now we could add in a little bit of work in your abdominals to help stabilize your spine and then make sure your head doesn't hang forward. Now we're gonna do a mini, totally like mini, mini push up. I'm gonna keep my knees in place. I'm gonna just focus on what my shoulders are doing. And I'm gonna think my elbows go out to the side, maybe a little bit back, kind of like they're reaching out to the corners of the room. I'm gonna bend my elbows a tiny bit and try to not lose all the stuff I was working on with straight elbows. So my blades are in place. I'm gonna think upper back of the shoulder tricep. And then as I push back to extended, I don't lock the joints. I keep the strength the whole time. So kind of a rotator cuff focused mini bend. I think last week I was using the word plie for the legs, a half bend. Sometimes I think of this as a plie of the arms, a little bend. 
And if you've got all the stuff working like it should be working, you should feel really a lot of work. You can feel a lot of work. Deeper, smaller, stabilizing muscles fatigue a little more quickly when we target them, partly because they're often a little weaker, but also because they're not meant to do a lot of really difficult things, right? They're meant to stabilize the joint, but they're not meant to lift 100 pounds. So this is why we keep it a very minor exercise. If I tried to do a push-up, it'd be really hard to target these muscles. If I'm just trying to do a full push-up. But because I'm doing such a minor push-up here, I can target those muscles. Bring yourself back and relax. Okay, so we're going to go into the 100. I feel like I haven't done the 100 in a couple weeks with you all. So then what happens in those little minor pumps in the 100? Like, what's that about? Sometimes people say, why do you flap your arms in the 100? And my response, which is probably a little annoying, is to be like, I don't flap my arms in the 100. I pump my arms in the 100. Um, but it, it, but it's, uh, it, it is a founded... Uh, retort I think it's not unfounded because if I flap this is more what happens right and that's not what I want to do I want to go right into the shoulder joint and feel that sense of pumping and if I do that I can get these muscles but if it does have that kind of flapping feeling right I'm not going to get those muscles my shoulder isn't moving at all here just my elbow right I want to see if I can take that towel movement that we had when you were reaching your arms behind you, find those muscles, connect into my belly, all the stuff, right? So I'm gonna try it with my feet down. I think feet down or legs and tabletop would be good um, in order to be able to focus on the shoulders a little bit more. So whichever you prefer, I'm gonna do feet on the floor. So start with your arms in that 100 position um, with your head down and see if you can feel not gripping your forearms, letting your elbows be a little bent, a little wide, like you had the towel, working some of those muscles in the upper back of the shoulder. And you could do this whole thing with your head down if you wanted to, but if you'd like, head comes up, find your abdominals, and then just take those pumps. If you want, take them a little more slowly. So maybe you do three pumps per inhale and three pumps per exhale instead of five. If that helps you, feel these muscles a little more. So just keep breathing. And pumping the arms. Easy forearms. Holding the arm from the upper back of the shoulder. And the tricep. And one more inhale, exhale. and lower everything down. And then let your arms be flat on the floor, however you like, and just let everything relax. Breathe into your shoulder girdle, collarbones, armpits, scapula, maybe even shoulder joint. Think of your inhale moving through those spaces and your exhale releasing those spaces. And then just See how it feels.
and then find your way up to sitting however you like and I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Scott Anderson and uh yeah see where he he takes you all with it Hello, everybody, and uh, really nice to talk about the shoulder girdle. And those of you who know the work that I've done over the years, like Colette, we really take a look at the shoulder girdle. I know a lot of people will focus on just the ball and socket joint and will perpetuate this myth that the shoulder blades need to stay down when your arms go up. But like you worked with, with Colette, is that freedom for your shoulder blades to move is every bit as important as their stability. And so what we're gonna do is, is do what I like to call the arm series. That's a continuation of all that great stuff you did with the towel. So let's begin in standing. And have your feet about hip width apart. And as I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, a really key part to having a healthy shoulder girdle is your breath. So let's begin by helping this exhale out. Get a little bit more stale air out. And then when you inhale, Feel how your rib cage naturally lifts and expands. It doesn't have to be your deepest breath. Sufficiently deep that when you inhale, you can feel your back ribs lift up and expand out. Then when you exhale, the reverse, your ribs drop. So getting those ribs to move is part of a healthy shoulder girdle. Because remember some of the key bones of your shoulder girdle, your clavicles and your scapulae directly relate to your rib cage. All right, so keep that breathing going. And now let's embark on the arm series. Begin by bringing your fingertips together and having your elbows at about your shoulder height. Head held high. Make sure your neck is out of it. Steady breathing. Now many people report this is kind of surprisingly fatiguing right here. It just gets more interesting. So keeping this internal rotation of your upper arms. And it's like you're going to be wiping a really high countertop. Slowly straighten your elbows. Now with the neck to exhale, swivel your head to the right. Inhale back to the middle. Exhale, swivel your head to the left. Inhale, back to the middle. Exhale, arms down. And shake your arms out a little bit. So in the chat, we had a report of a little bit of a strain between the shoulder blades. So what we're doing right here is building upon what Colette did. We're looking for it to work the back of the shoulder joint and the back of the shoulder blade, but not all that much right between the shoulder blade. So let's continue this thread, continuing with the deeper breathing, the breathing that gets your ribs moving. Then bring your arms up like this here. So whether you're channeling a saguaro cactus from the Sonoran Desert, or you're thinking about a goalpost, thinking about the Green Bay Packers, so the net result is your arms are externally rotated. Keep your arms externally rotated, and now like you're scrubbing a wall, slowly straighten your elbows. And holding here, lift up through the crown of your head. Exhale, swivel your head to the right. Inhale, back to the middle. Exhale, swivel left. 
Inhale, middle. Exhale, down. And let your arms be loose. So now we're going to make our way to the floor for yoga pose, head down dog. And I invite you, once we're down to the floor, to watch my shoulder blades. And we're going to be working a little bit more with that mobility. So to begin, exhale, take your arms up. Inhale, fold. Exhale, gorilla. That's where you reach the crown of your head forward. And then inhale, step your feet back. So if you look really carefully at my shoulder blades, I know that's kind of hard because I'm asking you to be in this pose, so maybe you come down for a moment. And watch how my shoulder blades slide along my back ribs as they go up toward my ears. And we'll spend a few breaths here. Feel free to move into dog pose if you haven't already. Move your shoulder blades along your back ribs up toward your ears. Five, four, three, two, one. Then with the next exhale, walk your feet up toward your hands. Here we are back in gorilla. Inhale, fold. Exhale all the way up. Inhale, arms down. All right, so shoulder blades, when you're standing up like this, against your back, not too high up toward your ears, and not too far down. Oftentimes people pull their shoulder blades down, causes all sorts of problems. So I like to think about like a little boat would be floating on the water. Let your shoulder blades float with your breath. What's that mean? When you inhale, let your shoulder blades rise up a little bit. And with the exhale, let them settle back down a bit. So your shoulder blades float with Ride with your breath. All right. So shoulder blade placement when your arms are below your shoulders is entirely different than when your arms are above your shoulder. So let's start with your left arm. Bring your left arm forward in front of you. And let your arm reach forward. Let that shoulder blade slightly wrap around the side of your rib cage. So you're mobilizing your shoulder blade. Now keep that shoulder blade wrapping as you slowly elevate that arm up and let your shoulder blade also ride up too. And we'll take a few breaths here. So shoulder blade has wrapped around, it's lifted up. And letting that arm come down. Left hand on your hip. Now right arm forward. Let that shoulder blade wrap around your side ribs. And then to match movement to breath with the next out breath, float that arm up. Let the shoulder blade continue to wrap. Let it elevate. A few moments here. And exhale, arms down. All right. Let your shoulder blades float on the breath. All right. Bet you can see this one coming. Both arms. Bring both arms forward. Let your scapulae slide around your side ribs. Head held high. Then with the exhale, sweep your arms up. Let your shoulder blades slide up a bit. This is what shoulder blades do in head down dog. And exhale, arms down. All right, so I'm going to do dog pose first. And 
in the interest of expedience, I'm just going to go down to my hands and knees. And once again, I invite you to take a peek. So watch how my shoulder blades do exactly what we did in standing. They wrap around the side ribs. And then as I move my hips to the wall back behind me, watch how my shoulder blades slide up my back ribs toward my ears. Now, some people get a pinch in their neck. Of course, we don't want that. So if that's your experience, check in with letting your head hang. Let your head drop. So if you haven't already, moving into head down dog, letting the shoulder blades, which are part of the shoulder girdle, make the movement they're intended to make, which is to wrap around and glide up. Let's take one more deep breath here. Exhale, stepping forward. Gorilla. Inhale, folding. Exhale all the way up. Inhale, arms down. All right. So now let's revisit something you've already done. Find your towel. So you could use a towel to mop your brow if you're, you're in a hot room. Or using your towel, just like Colette shared a few a little bit earlier, to give you a little bit of resistance to connect into the back of your shoulder. So remember how elbows face out, a little bit of a soft bend. Keep your forearms out of it and give a little tug. Hello, rotator cuff. And then let's continue this visit. Exhale, float your arms up. Inhale down. You've done quite a few of these already. Let's just do one more here. Exhale, elbows to the side. Little tug. All right, now the other way, we bring the towel behind you. Same exact thing, elbows face to the side, shoulder blades against your back, head held high. And a little bit of a tug, tugging on the towel. And then to help mobilize the glenohumeral joint, exhale, take the towel behind you. Inhale, return. Two more like that. Exhale. Inhale. One more. All right. Now, let's build on this on your belly. So coming onto your belly, have that towel nearby. We're going to use a towel again. And before we involve the towel, let's take a moment here to align your spine. So most of us, our heads are forward. So to help rectify that head forward posture, bring your upper chest as close to the floor as you can. And then float your nose and chin. All right. So then keeping that alignment in your spine, catch the towel behind you. So this is the same exact thing we did in standing. Shoulder blades against your back. Elbows facing toward the side wall. Keeping your elbows facing the side wall. Little tug on the towel. Then with the next exhale, lift your head and chest a little bit. Keep that light tug on the towel. And now with the next exhale, lift the towel and your arms up a few inches. I'm going to hold here for a count of five, four, three, two, one. Releasing the towel down, setting the towel aside. We'll come back to it later. Bring your hands toward your armpits. Push up to hands and knees. 
and then back to head down dog. Three deep breaths here. So remember how shoulder blades wrap and elevate. And then come on down and transition to your back. So you worked a little bit earlier with Kalata on your back. So just a little bit drawing your shoulder blades under so there's a sense there against your back. Bring your arms next to your torso. And if possible, hands on the floor. And take your elbows out toward the side. So it's like you have the towel behind your back, but of course you don't have the towel behind your back. But same basic inner dynamic alignment. So keeping your chest open, keeping your arms in that internal spiral, you slowly lift your hips up. Here we are in bridge. And we're going to hold here for kind of five, four, three, two, one and then slowly lowering down. All right, how was that? If you're anything like me, when I internally rotate my arms, I tend to feel my shoulders rounding forward. And that's kind of a chronic thing in my body. It's a, something I've worked with most of my life. And so we're gonna work with a little bit more that idea of your shoulder blades, not you know rigidly against your back, but just a sense that your chest is open. And then maintaining that sense of your chest open as you internally spiral both your arms. This time have the towel nearby. We're gonna, we're gonna use it. All right, so shoulder blades a little bit drawn back. It's called scapular retraction. Keeping your scaps retracted, internally spiral your arms. Then lift your hips up. Then once your hips are lifted, find your towel. And just like we did in standing just a little bit ago, give the towel a little bit of a tug. And we're gonna hold here for kind of five, strengthen in the backs of your shoulders. Four, three, releasing your neck. Two, one, release the towel and come on down. So maybe you're watching me and going, well, he didn't need to release the towel to come down. Keep in mind, I have really long arms. Pretty much almost everybody else needs to before they come down. All right, let's head back to hands and knees, to head down dog. A couple deep breaths right here. And come on down to your belly. We're going to revisit what we did before. Aligning your spine. Catching the towel behind your back. Keeping your shoulder blades back, your chest open. Internally spiraling your arms. Give the towel a little bit of a tug. Maintain the tug as you lift your head and chest a bit. Maintain the tug as you float the towel in your arms up, holding here for kind of five, four, long neck, three, two, one. Coming down. Setting the towel aside and pushing up. Head down, dog. Two deep breaths. And then come on down to your knees. 
and ending up knees bent, feet flat upon the floor. Could be hands on your knees or could be catching your knees with your elbows. Sitting up tall. So this once again is arms internally rotated, isn't it? So maintaining that inner rotation as you gently draw your shoulder blades onto your back. Lift up through the crown of your head to release your neck. And a few breaths right here. All right. So let's move into some deep breathing. And, and doing that is accomplished best in a sitting position. So sitting in a chair works best for a majority of people. Some people like to sit on a cushion or folded blanket. So one of the themes that maybe you've already noticed is to have your chest open, shoulder blades against your back, while your arms are free to do what they do. I know a lot of people will place their shoulder blades into position by doing something kind of funny with the arms that may put your shoulder blades against your back, but then you can't do anything. You know, like I am right now, I couldn't wash the dishes, I couldn't take out the trash, couldn't hug a baby, couldn't work on my computer. So functional posture allows your torso to be aligned, your shoulder blades to be aligned when your arms are internally rotated. So if you haven't already, let's start off with hands down. Rather than your elbows pinching your torso, let there be a little bit of space between your arms and your trunk. And in several meditation traditions, this is called vulture arms. They had a different association with vultures in different cultures. All right, so now there's some room for your rib cage. And now let's use that room to do some deep breathing, deeper than what we even did before. So stay air out. Fill your whole rib cage, back, sides, front. Stay or out. Now, if you've had some aches and pains in your shoulder girdle, inhale into those places. You can almost imagine that your in-breath is like paint. Wherever you may be stiff or sore, paint those places. Let your shoulder blades be free to move, even though we're talking a little bit about alignment, keeping your chest open. Rather than shoulder blades rigidly in place, let them be free to float. Two more deep breaths. One more deep breath. All right, now letting go of the deep breathing.
Letting your breathing be. Witnessing your breathing. So thank you all for joining us. Each week, we have 21 classes, ranging from cardio to Pilates, to yoga base, to bar. What we're doing here is kind of somatic work. And if you're interested, please check out our website, PilatesOnHarrison.com or ScottAndersonYoga.com. We also have a program coming up next weekend, and uh, Colette and I are going to be doing another webinar. We'll be taking a look at these mind-body practices that we do as part of being resilient and healthy throughout the lifespan. And uh, I think a lot of us, you know, we take a look at what's on the horizon 20, 30 years down the road. And of course, we can't control how everything's going to go. But we can do some of these practices that are going to make it more likely that it feels good to be in the body that you have, that you'll have the energy and vitality to do what it is that you want to do. So that's coming up a week from today, uh, and the link should be in the chat. So any comments, questions in the chat? Yes, and like the breathing into your shoulder is a gentle massage of the rotator cuff muscles. Yeah, so the question is the deep breathing uh, does it provide a gentle massage for the rotator cuff muscles? I'd actually pan back a little bit farther than that, that doing some deep breathing, ideally each day, really is a massage pretty much for your whole body. And uh, we were focused today on shoulder girdle, rib cage, collarbone, scapulae. But if you get a chance in the coming days to do some really deep breathing and notice just how much movement there is really in your whole body. So not to advocate that you do deep breathing, you know, all day, every day, but to do a little bit each day can be a really nice massage for your whole body, all the different muscles. In terms of the rotator cuff, yes, the rotator cuff will be involved in the deep breathing, especially with how we ended right there, that if you let your arms be free and hang, naturally there tends to be this air gap in the side ribs, that that's going to be your rotator cuff muscles that helps support that alignment? Great question. Anybody else? That's it. Thank you so much. And we do this every Saturday. Please tell your friends. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. It's in the red button right below your screen. And that helps us out quite a bit. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Bye-bye.